This BYU devotional by Elder Bruce R. McConkie was given November 6, 1977. I stand before you tonight in the spirit of this musical number, I Need Thee Every Hour, and hope and pray and desire that I may be given utterance by the power of the Spirit, so that I may say those things that will please the Lord, that would be the things that He would say if He personally were addressing this great congregation at this hour. After consulting with Brother Lauren Wheelwright, he telling me that it would be most appropriate if I spoke on a Thanksgiving theme since it would implement the music. I decided to do that and prepared my mind and an outline and gathered some quotations. But since arriving here tonight, I've had nothing but a stupor of thought and uncertainty in my mind as to that subject. And so think now that if I can be guided by the power of the Spirit and say what will please the Lord, that I'd like to talk to you somewhat informally, perhaps, about the obligation that rests upon Latter-day Saints to create for themselves eternal family units which are patterned after the family of God our Heavenly Father. And so that we may all be united in our thinking and be in a position to build on the same foundation, have in mind the same eternal truths, I shall initially read three or four brief passages from the Revelations and then hope and pray that I may be given utterance and that the hearts of all of you may be opened by the power of the same Spirit so that we will be mutually edified will be one in feeling and in attitude where these great doctrinal principles are concerned, and will have riveted in our souls the determination to do all the things that must be done in this mortal probation in order to be inheritors of the fullness of the glory of our Father's kingdom. I take for one text these words from section 42, the revelation entitled, The Law of the Church. Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and none else. And in the spirit of those words, I take from the Old Testament book of Ruth, these expressions, which though not uttered originally with reference to marriage, contain a principle that's wholly applicable. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also. And now I will change it slightly. If even death part thee and me. Now a passage from section 49 in the Doctrine and Covenants, which summarizes the basic administrative announcement relative to marriage 
for our dispensation. Verily I say unto you, saith the Lord, that whoso forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God, for marriage is ordained of God unto man. Wherefore it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, and all this that the earth might answer the end of its creation, and that it might be filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was made. Now, when we talk about marriage as Latter-day Saints, we're talking about a holy celestial order. We're talking about a system out of which the greatest love and joy and peace and happiness and serenity that is known to humankind can grow. We're talking about creating a family unit that has the potential of being everlasting and eternal, a family unit where a man and a wife can go on in that relationship to all eternity, and where there will be mother and daughter and father and son, eternal ties that never will be severed. We're talking about creating a unit more important than the Church, more important than any organization that exists on earth or in heaven, an organi a unit out of which exaltation and eternal life grow. And when we talk about eternal life, we're talking about the kind of life that God, our Heavenly Father, lives. In this final glorious gospel dispensation, we've received the basic, the most basic truth of all eternity, and that truth is the nature and kind of being that God is. It's eternal life to know the Father and the Son. There is no possible way to go degree by degree, step by step, to the high exaltation we seek unless and until we come to a knowledge of the nature and kind of being that God is. And so when we talk about eternal life, we're talking about the kind of life that God our Father lives. And when we speak of Him, we're speaking of a holy, perfected, exalted, ennobled man, an individual, a personage, an individual who has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. We're talking about someone who is a literal parent who is the father of the spirits of all men. You and I were born as members of his family. We've seen his face, we've heard his voice, we've received his counsel personally as well as through representatives and agents. We knew him in pre-existence. Now a curtain has been dropped and we don't have the remembrance that we had then. But we are seeking to do the things that will enable us to be like him. Now, after he had begotten us as his spirit children, he gave us our agency, which is the power and ability to choose. And he gave us laws and allowed us to obey or disobey, in consequence of which we could develop talents and abilities and aptitudes and characteristics of diverse sorts. He ordained and established a plan of salvation. It was named the Gospel of God, meaning God our Heavenly Father, and it consisted of all of the laws and powers and rights, all of the experiences, all of the gifts and graces that are needed to take a spirit son and daughter from the then spirit state of low intelligence to the high exalted state where we would be like him. The prophet Joseph Smith tells us that God himself, finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory, 
ordained laws whereby they might advance and progress and become like him. Those laws included the creation of this earth, they included the receipt of a mortal body where we could be tried and tested in a probationary estate and receive experiences that it's not possible to gain in other, any other way. They included the opportunity to choose right and wrong between them, to do good or to do evil, the opportunity to grow and advance in the things of the Spirit, they included the opportunity to enter into a marriage relationship that has the potential of being eternal. Now, we started out on this course in the pre-mortal life. We're down here now taking the final examination for all the life that we lived back then, which also is the entrance examination into the realms and kingdoms that are ahead. Now, the name of the kind of life that God our Father lives is eternal life. And eternal life consists of two things. It consists of the continuation of the family unit in eternity. And it consists of inheriting what the scriptures denominate the fullness of the Father are the fullness of the glory of the Father, meaning the might and power and dominion and exaltation that he himself possesses. And in our finite circumstances, we have no ability or power to comprehend the might and omnipotence of the Father. We can look at the sidereal heavens, we can view the Milky Way, we can see all the worlds and, or and orbs that have been created in their spheres. We can examine all the life that is on this planet with which we are familiar. And we can begin to get a concept of the glorious, infinite, unlimited intelligence by which all these things are. And all these things taken together and more comprise the fullness of the glory of the Father. Now, we are seeking eternal life. That is to say, we have been offered the privilege to go forward in advancement as the children of God until we become like our eternal parent. And if we so obtain, it is required, it is requisite, it is mandatory, for us to build on the foundation of the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. It is required of us that we keep the commandments, that we sow the seeds of righteousness and reap the harvest of glory and honor. Now, if we do all the things that the gospel requires of us, we can make that kind of advancement. The gospel, which is the plan of salvation, is now named the gospel of Jesus Christ to do honor to him who worked out the infinite and eternal atoning sacrifice and who put into operation all of the terms and conditions of the Father's plan. Now, God our Father is the creator of all things, and we glorify his holy name and we sing praises to him because he created us, and in the ultimate sense, he created the universe, the earth, all things that are on all the orbs that exist in all the sidereal heavens. God, our Father, is the ultimate and perfect creator. Jesus Christ, his Son, is the Redeemer. He came to ransom us from the temporal and spiritual death brought into the world by the fall of Adam. The ransom from temporal death gives each of us immortality. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And every living soul will rise in the resurrection with immortality, and having so arisen, will be judged according to his works, and will be assigned a place in the kingdoms which are prepared. 
Now, some men will be raised in immortality and then unto eternal life. And eternal life is the name of the kind of life that God lives. Now, we cannot shout praises to the name of the Lord Jehovah, who is the Lord Jesus, in any degree or to the extent that we ought to honor him for all that he has done for us and for the possibilities that lie ahead because he took upon himself our sins on conditions of repentance. Now, that was the work of God the Father, creation. And that was the work of Christ the Son, redemption. Now, we are men, and our work, building on the foundation that God our Father laid, and building upon the foundation that Christ his Son has established. Our work is to do the part assigned to us in order to be inheritors of the glory and honor and dignity of which I speak. And in general terms, that means that we are to accept and believe the law. We're to believe in Christ and live his law. We're to be upright and clean. We're to have our sins washed away in the waters of baptism. We're to become new creatures by the power of the Holy Ghost. We're to walk in paths of truth and righteousness all our days. We can talk in general terms about this. It's a process of overcoming the world, a process of rising above carnality, of doing good and working righteousness. And as long as we are in that vein, all that we say is generalities and is a foundation for a specific and particular thing toward which we point. And that spe specific and particular thing is eternal marriage. Everything that we do in the church is connected and associated with and tied in to the eternal order of matrimony that God has ordained. Everything that we do from the time that we are born, from the time we become accountable, through all our experiences and all the counsel and direction we receive, up to the time of marriage. Everything that we do is designed and intended to prepare us to enter into the order of matrimony which may be eternal. I say may because we enter into a probationary arrangement and it does in fact become eternal only if we abide in the covenant made in connection with that order of matrimony. And then everything that we do for the remainder of our lives as long as we live, be it whatsoever it may be, is something that ties back in to the celestial order of matrimony into which we have entered, and it is designed and intended to encourage us to keep the covenant made in holy places. Now that is the general concept, briefly stated, under which we are operating. Let me now read from the Revelation on Marriage the general concept, yes, but given in a little more particularity, with a little more, that governs in this field. And I read in section 132, verse 5, All who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law which was appointed for that blessing, and the conditions thereof as were instituted from before the foundation of the world. That is the basic governing overriding principle that governs all of the acts of men in all ages. No one ever gets anything for nothing. We have received as a free gift the fact of resurrection. In a sense, that even is not free in that we lived meritoriously and uprightly in pre-existence and earned the right to undergo this mortal probation. In the broadest and most eternal perspective that there is, 
no one ever gets anything for nothing. And so we live the law and we get the blessing. And having said that, then the Lord says, as pertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, it was instituted for the fullness of my glory. And he that receiveth a fullness thereof must and shall abide the law, or he shall be damned, saith the Lord God. Now, the new and the everlasting covenant is the fullness of the gospel. The gospel is the covenant of salvation that the Lord makes with men. It is new because it has been revealed anew in our day. It is everlasting because it's always been had by faithful people, not alone on this earth, but on all the earths that are inhabited by the children of our Father. Now this next verse, number seven, is a one-sentence summary of the whole law of the whole gospel, and it's written in legal language of necessity because it outlines the terms and conditions that are involved. And it's the Lord, of course, speaking. And verily I say unto you that the conditions of this law are these. Now this recites the conditions of the law that govern in the whole field of revealed religion. Everything, and we will make specific application of it to the central thing we have to do, which is marriage. Here are the conditions. All covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed, both as well for time and for all eternity, and that too most holy by revelation and commandment through the medium of mine anointed, whom I have appointed on the earth to hold this power, and I have appointed unto my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days, and there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred, are of no efficacy, virtue, or force, in and after the resurrection from the dead. For all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. Now what is involved? We have power as mortals to make any arrangements between ourselves that we choose to make, which are legal in the society where we live, and they will bind us as long as we agree to be bound, and that may be until death takes us. But we do not have power as mortals to bind ourselves after death. I cannot enter a contract and you cannot enter a contract to buy or sell or go or come or paint or perform or do any act in the sphere that is ahead. God has given us our agency here and now as pertaining to mortality. Now we are mortal. It's a temporal sphere. It's a time-bound sphere. And if we're going to do anything here and now that bridges the gulf of death, anything that endures in the spirit world, anything that remains with us in the resurrection. We've got to do it by a power that is beyond the power of man. It has to be the power of God. Man is mortal and his acts are limited to mortality. God is eternal and his acts have no end. And so the Lord confers upon Peter the keys of the kingdom of God, so that he has power to bind on earth and seal everlastingly in the heavens. 
And then he spreads that out to James and John and to all of the twelve anciently. And they all have the same power. And then in our day he restores again what was had anciently. He calls apostles and prophets, and he gives them the keys of the kingdom of God. And they have power once again to bind on earth and have it sealed everlastingly in the heavens. He sends Elijah to bring the sealing power. He sends Elijah to confer upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery the gospel of Abraham and give them the promise that in them and in their seed all generations after shall be blessed. And because Elijah came and because Elias came, acting in the power and authority of the Almighty, and gave their keys and powers and prerogatives and rights to mortal men, once again on earth, praise God for this glorious thing, once again on earth, there are people who can bind on earth and have it sealed everlastingly in the heavens. And so we have the power to perform a marriage, and we can do it so that the man and the woman become husband and wife here and now, and so that if they keep the covenant there and then made, they will remain husband and wife in the spirit world, and they'll come up in glory and dominion with kingdoms and exaltation in the resurrection, being husband and wife and having eternal life. And it operates because in this church, and in this church only, the Lord Almighty has given the sealing power. Now that is our potential. That is within our possible realm of achievement. And so we read in this one sentence summary, as I express it, of the whole law, of the whole gospel, we read three requisites. If a person, for instance, is going to have a baptism that lasts eternally, he must, number one, find the right baptism. He must, number two, find a legal administrator to perform the ordinance for him. And he must, number three, have that ordinance sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, in which event the baptism will admit the repentant person to a celestial heaven in the realms ahead. This matter of being sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise applies to every ordinance and every covenant and all things that there are in the church. Do not get talking about marriage and the Holy Spirit of promise unless and until you understand first the concept and the principle, which is that it has universal application. One of our revelations says, The Holy Spirit of promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true, meaning that every person who walks uprightly, every person who does the best that he can, every person who overcomes the world, rises above carnality, walks in paths of righteousness, will have his acts and his deeds sealed and approved by the Holy Spirit. He will be, as Paul would have expressed it, justified by the Spirit. And so if someone is going to be married, and he wants a marriage that lasts for a week or three weeks or three months or as long as Hollywood prescribes, or even until death us do part, he can be married by the power of man. He can make a contract within the parameters and the limits that are set. He has that prerogative by the agency that the Lord has given him. But if he wants a wife to be his in the realms ahead, he better find someone who has power to bind on earth and seal in heaven. So in order to get a proper marriage, what we do is this. We search for and seek out celestial marriage. We find the right ordinance. That's number one. Number two, we look for a legal administrator, someone who holds the sealing power. 
And that power is exercised only in the temples which the Lord has had built by the tithing and the sacrifice of his people in our day. Those are two requirements. And number three, he so lives in righteousness and uprightness and integrity and virtue and morality that he is entitled to have the Holy Spirit of God ratify and seal and justify and approve. approve. And in that event, his marriage is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, and it's binding in time and in eternity. So what we do, we struggle and labor and work to be worthy to get a recommend to go to the temple. The Spirit will not dwell in an unclean tabernacle. We struggle and labor to get our tabernacles clean, to be pure and refined and accultured, to have the Spirit as our companion. And when we get in that state, our bishop and our stake president give us a recommend to go to the temple. And we go there and we make solemn and sober covenants. And then having so done, we continue to labor and struggle and work with all our power to continue in the light of the Spirit so that the agreement we have made will not be broken. Now, if we do that, we have the assurance. We do not need to tremble and fear. We do not need to have anxiety or worry. If we're laboring and working and struggling to the best of our abilities, though we do not become perfect, though we do not overcome all things, yet if our hearts are right and we're charting a course to eternal life in the manner I indicate, our marriages will continue in the realms that are ahead. We'll get into the paradise of God and we'll be husband and wife. We'll come up in the resurrection and we'll be husband and wife. And anyone who comes up in the resurrection in the marriage state, married state, has the absolute guarantee of eternal life. He will not then be a possessor and inheritor of all things. There's a great deal of progress and advancement to be made after the grave and after the resurrection. But he will be in the course where he will go on in the schooling and preparing processes until eventually he knows all things and becomes like God our Heavenly Father, meaning he becomes an inheritor of eternal life. Now, in a manner of speaking, we have here and now probationary families. We have that kind of a family even though we've been married in the temple because our marriage in the temple is conditional. It's conditioned upon our subsequent compliance with the laws, the terms, the conditions of the covenant that we then make. And so I get married in the temple. That puts me in a position where I can strive and labor and learn to love my wife with the perfection that must exist if I'm going to have a fullness of the glory that attends that in eternity. And it puts her in a position to learn to love me in the same way. And it puts both of us in a position to bring up our children in light and in truth and to school them and prepare them to be members of an eternal family unit. And it puts us as the children of our parents in the position where we honor our parents and do what is necessary there to have these eternal ties go from one generation to the next and the next and so on. Eventually, there will be a great patriarchal chain of exalted beings from Adam to the last man, with any links being left out of individuals who are not qualified and worthy to inherit, possess, and receive along the indicated line. Now, I'm talking to people who have opportunity to live the law. And anyone who has the opportunity is required to do so. It's mandatory. 
I'm perfectly well aware that there are people who do not have the opportunity, but who would have done so had the opportunity been afforded them. And those individuals will be judged in the providences and mercy of a gracious God according to the intents and desires of their hearts. It's the principle of salvation and exaltation for the dead. Well, I've talked only in general terms. I have not been specific, deliberately so. I have designed to set forth, as the prophet indicated in his statement, I teach them correct principles and they govern themselves. I've desired and designed to set forth the general concept that is involved with the hope that having the concept before us, each of us will then determine for ourselves as individuals the courses that we have to pursue to obtain the indicated rewards. I think that the noblest concept that can enter the heart of a man is the fact that the family unit continues in eternity. I do not think you can come up with a more glorious concept than that, building, of course, on the foundation of the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Because this business of celestial marriage is the thing that will give us eternal life in our Father's kingdom. And if we can pass the probationary experiences that prevail and exist in the family unit, then the Lord will say to us at some future day, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of your Lord. Now, the things we're talking about here are true. That's the glory and the wonder and the beauty of everything connected with this system of revealed religion that we have. It's true. There is no more glorious fact connected with our whole system of revealed religion than the simple fact that it's true. And because it's true, the doctrines we teach are true. And because these doctrines are true, they will give us peace and joy and happiness in this life, They'll enable us to cast off the drudgery and the sludge and the evils and the iniquities of the world. They empower us to put on Christ and the glory and beauty of pure religion. They enable us to become new creatures of the Holy Ghost. It's a wondrous thing beyond belief to belong to a system that's true, that's founded on the rock foundation of eternal truth. I hope, as I bear testimony to you of the truth and divinity of this work, that my words simply echo the thoughts that are in your hearts. I know, just as well as I know anything in this world, that God has spoken in our day, that Jesus is the Lord, that he's worked out the infinite and eternal atoning sacrifice, that the Lord has set up his kingdom for the last time among men, that Spencer W. Kimball at this moment is the prophet and revelator and mouthpiece of the Almighty on earth, and that this church, weak and struggling and humble as it is now, is going to advance and grow and progress until the knowledge of God covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Our destiny is to fill the earth because we're founded on the rock foundation of eternal truth. There is nothing in all this world like the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I bear witness of it and hope that as you say amen, you will thus make my witness your witness and that you will then be under covenant to do the things that must be done to gain peace and joy in this life and to be an inheritor of eternal life in the world to come. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Amen. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This BYU devotional by Elder Bruce R. McConkie was given November 6, 1977.